good morning, and it's Grandma Roseanne, but you already know that because you popped into my kitchen. What we're going to do today is make a dish that it takes a long time, but it doesn't really take a long time in preparation, but its cooking time is like two to two and a half hours, but that's okay because you can go do other stuff while it's cooking. What I'm going to make is a Hungarian goulash. Now, an American goulash is different than a Hungarian. An American goulash has ground beef, ground pork, and macaroni. Not Hungarian. Hungarian goulash, we're going to start out with just beef. And you want to have an inexpensive cut of beef. So you want to have like a beef chuck or something like that. And what we're going to do, well, before I even do that, I've got two tablespoons of olive oil. I've got my... Uh, my pot here on high because we're going to sear this. So what you want to do is just start cutting chunks. Now you have a lot of connective tissue in here. Do you see that? And that's good. That's real good. That's what you're wanting. It's all going to be tender when we finish. It'll be lovely. What I have here is almost three pounds. If you have two and a half pounds, you're probably still good with this recipe. I don't know how I started cutting that backwards. But just to flip around and I'm correct. I'm cutting it in rather large chunks, probably half inch chunks. And then I'm going to cut it into smaller pieces. Oh, you have to wait a minute because I can smell something in my oven that needs attention. Give me one second. Look at that, you guys. Aren't they beautiful? Wow. Can you hear the crunch on them? These bad boys are going to go with our Hungarian goulash. All right. Back to our goulash. I could smell them. They smell so wonderful. All right. Now we want to cut them into chunks like that. Just about that size. Can you see that? I know I drive cameraman crazy when I decide that I, I just got to make this. I've got to make it. And that's what it was with this. I had to make this. So I'm so glad that we have the time today that we can make it. And while it's um, doing its time in the oven, which is like two and a half hours, we're just going to go out and do a little bit of Christmas shopping. There. Now, I want you to look at our last bit of roses over here. That's probably about the last blush now until we trim everything back and get ready for the spring roses to come. Now, we want to do this in rather small batches. So I have salt and pepper here. I'm just going to start with what I have here. I would say that's about a teaspoon of salt and about a half a teaspoon of pepper. Can you see in here, cameraman? Pretty high heat, and you don't want to you don't want to crowd them because when you crowd the meat, then you're no longer searing, and you're not going to get that crust and that brown on it. When you sear the meat, that's what you're doing. You're developing that outer layer of amazing flavor. But if you crowd them all in, then they steam. They steam, and that's not what we're looking for right now. All right, I will continue my cutting. Now, obviously, it's close to Christmas, and we're in California, so our roses are still blooming, and it's still pretty nice out. But for a lot of years, you guys, I lived in Chicago, 
And what I know is at this time of the year, it was getting cold. It was snow, maybe a lot of snow on the ground. And those were the times that I loved making things like this, like hearty stews and really thick soups and Hungarian goulash. So if you have that winter experience going on right now, this might be just wonderful for you. And for heaven's sakes, if you're going to make this, don't buy an expensive roast because this cooks for so long, it'll tenderize anything. So buy the least expensive piece of meat you can find. And usually that's a chuck roast. Come on in and look. I'm surprised he's not just coming in. He's usually so snoopy, cameraman. You see how it's getting that really nice crystal, not crystal, that really nice caramelization on it? And I was getting some pictures of it when you weren't looking. Okay, I did not know. Now I'm going to change something up here because I made a little bit of a mistake. Not a mistake that's going to hurt anything, but a mistake that I want to have corrected. Typically what I do is I brown the onions first. And I'm going to just take out this one section of beautiful beef. And I'm going to go ahead and throw in the onions. I don't want them just wilted. What I really want the onions is I want them golden. And what it's doing is it's going to allow me to have a lot more flavor in the pan here. So that's rather important. So do as I say, not as I do, and get your onions in there first. Now, I gave these onions a really rough chop, and I want them to hold up when we're doing the cooking for the couple of hours. I don't want them to disintegrate. So I'm just going to let these cook down and let them get kind of golden. I will finish seasoning my, salt, my meat over here. I would love to know from you guys what dishes you create for your families that have become really, I don't know, maybe staples in your family that other people might not be doing. Or what is it that you cook on really cold, windy days or anything that you do like that. I would love to know about that. I am always open to looking for new recipes and new ways of doing things that I've been doing probably the same way for many years. I think it's really good when we change things up. Here and take a look. We're still not there, but look at how much more golden they're becoming. Now, if you really want to speed up the process, this is what you do. You keep your hands out of the pot. Virtually impossible for me. I always am stirring and messing around with the food. But if you just give them undisturbed, couple of minutes and then go in and give them another little stir and then leave them undisturbed they're going to caramelize faster and that's what we're looking for and what happens for those onions when they caramelize you know how an onion if you were just to take it and take a bite out of it it would be like oh good grief I that is horrible as you caramelize them and as that real real strong flavor starts leaving they begin to develop a sweetness and that's what's happening here. You do the same thing with garlic. You can do exactly the same thing. Garlic, eating it raw, would be pretty pungent. But if you take a garlic clove, cut maybe the top fourth off, drizzle it with some olive oil, wrap it in some foil, pop it in your oven at like, I don't know, 350, 400 degrees for, I don't know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, stick a, a, a toothpick in. And when you squeeze that out, oh, mercy, it is just sweet and delicious. I love that. And then what you can do with that roasted garlic is you can make roasted mashed potatoes. You can use it in, I use roasted garlic in everything. Okay, I think I'm golden enough here. So I'm going to take this out. Now can you see how much flavor we have in this pan? And 
and I'm careful to get them all out because they will burn if you leave them in there. So even these last stubborn ones have to come out there. Okay. All I can tell you guys is between the aroma of that bread and these onions and that meat searing, anybody that would walk into my house right now would be sitting down for dinner. It would be like, what are you making? And I want some of it. <clears throat> All right, I'm on my last batch here. So I'm moving everything whoa, over to a plate. You just know how many juices have been trapped in there. I turn my um, cooking element down here a little bit because I've been searing and it's been really hot. So just a minute while I kind of switch gears here. So now we're getting ready for our seasoning and we're going to put them in here and we're just going to let them develop in here. I have two tablespoons of paprika Yes, it's a lot. It's Hungarian. Two teaspoons of Italian seasoning. Half a teaspoon of cayenne. Two tablespoons of Worcestershire. A dash of salt. A little bit of pepper. And four garlic cloves. And now we're just going to just cook these down until we are smelling. Oh, the beautiful flavors. Mm. Boy, you can smell them. It's called blooming when you're blooming the um, the herbs and it's like they do come into a full bloom and to this I'm going to add 26 ounces of tomatoes just crushed tomatoes four cups of chicken broth And how I didn't splash that all over my yellow sweater, I have no idea. Six ounces of tomato paste. <clears throat> and one can of the water. We're going to add the onions back in with all their delicious flavor. And now the meat goes in. And all the juices, look at how many juices came with that. Ah, oh, that is like delicious. I've got this on high right now, and I'm going to bring it up to just about to a boil, and then I'm going to reduce it to a very low simmer, and it's going to be here for probably two and a half hours. All right, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, let this come up, as I said a moment ago, to kind of a soft boil. I'm going to move it over to my stove top, and rather than this, this is just easier for filming, but if we're going to be gone, I would rather be using my stove top. And then I'll come back in about two and a half hours and I'll let you know where we are. All right, well, we have completed this meal and I want you to take a look at this. Look at how thick and rich and luscious that looks. Really, really, really mm. nice. Now, I'm going to um, tell you that I'm not the one that's going to taste this like I always, always, always do. The reason for that, as it was completing its cooking and I'm tasting it, 
it's too hot for me. It's I'm kind of sensitive to heat, um, spicy heat, and I did not realize that two tablespoons of paprika would throw off that much heat. So if you're a little sensitive to heat, I will tell you the flavoring of this is very good, but you might considerably reduce the paprika in it. Now, on the other hand, cameraman tasted it and he said, oh, that is so good. So we're gonna serve this to cameraman and he's going to love it and I'm glad he is because cameraman now has three pounds of this to eat. So, <laughs> uh, you think you're up for it? I'm ready. <laughs> now you can serve this over noodles, you can serve it over rice. If it were me, I would be doing rice. Cameraman, I mean, I would be doing noodles. Cameraman really, really enjoys rice. So, we're gonna give him a nice hefty portion here. <laughs> the growing boy. Been smelling that cook all day, it's been great. I'm ready for it. Yeah. I will tell you guys, uh, and both of us have tried it, the meat is so tender. Oh yeah. So good. So I think this is going to make a very, very nice dinner for cameraman. And the rolls that we made earlier this morning are magnificent. So he's going to have this roll and this beautiful dinner. I'm going to have this roll and a tuna fish sandwich. <laughs> That's the best I can do. So you guys, I hope you try it. But if you do, and especially if you're giving it to children, really tone down, really, really turn down the paprika. All of the ingredients will be below. So at your own discretion, just know that everything else I think is very balanced in the dish. And if I make it again, which I will make it again, um, I will just make a few adjustments on the heat. So with that, uh, hit subscribe come back love having you ingredients below and hit the little bell because we are just posting all the time now thank you bye